Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Today I'm here with a special guest. She's a mother of four, also working a full-time job. Charlotte no Schwartz, problem. everybody. I graduated high school in the year 2000. Yep. <laughs> so when I went to high school, we still had five years of high school. Like how much work is actually involved? Like how much homework am I going to be doing? How much reading am I going to be doing? I don't need to do this to work. Women specifically have gained more power in the employment field yep. and in you know earning their own money and stuff like that. And a lot of marriages just didn't end, even though they probably should have. The Kardashians have already been married like five times a piece <laughs> yeah. or something, right? So yeah. the most FOMO that I would have had was sitting by the radio waiting for my favorite songs to come on so that <laughs> yeah. I could press play and record at the same time on the cassette. Did you have a phone when you were 14? 15. Okay. I have a 14 year old, a 13 year old, a 10 year old, and a five year old. I go through their phones. Like I didn't care about anything before I had kids. I cared about getting paid every two weeks. I cared about what club we were going to on Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday night. Like yeah. I, I really didn't care about much. Like, is there a lot of problem with schools? Cause we had a protest like a few months ago about the sex education in schools here. Oh, I know. Uh, it taught the sort of spectrum of, of identities also really important. So I was 18. For like Y2K, which was actually really scary. But if you're pregnant and you don't want to be, that should be your choice. One. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the VOV podcast, Voices of Vic. Today I'm here with a special guest. This is our first ever, what do you, we just call them mature students. That's what is they that call the word it. For it. Yeah. Thank you for coming on. Charlotte no Schwartz, problem. everybody. Third year English student. Yeah. Awesome. So, Appreciate you doing this. She's a mother of four, also working a full-time job, also doing a part-time passion project. Is that fair to say? Yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot that you're doing. <laughs> yeah. And I think you're setting a good example, not only for the students here, but obviously for your kids as well. Thank you. So why don't you just tell us a bit about yourself? You know, what's your story? How did you get here? That's did a good you do question. undergrad when you were our age? Or? No, I didn't. I went to college right after high school. So when I went to high school. I graduated high school in the year 2000. Yep. <laughs> so when I went to high school, we still had five years of high school, the OAC yep. year, the Ontario Academic Curriculum year. Um, and if you wanted to apply to university, you had to go for that fifth year and get six credits. Yep. And then they put a lot of emphasis on those grades. So um, I did five years of high school and then I decided to go to college instead. I had a really um unhelpful guidance counselor in high school who I'm told sure me many can relate yeah i was not um university material wow okay <laughs> which was like a huge gut punch yeah um so i went to college and so i went to seneca college in north york and uh, i took the it's called the law clerk diploma program and i have been a a uh, law clerk specializing in family law, so like divorces and stuff for yeah. 22 years. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so That's awesome. longer than you've been alive. That's it, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. So what has been the experience so far at U of T? When did you start? I'm obviously, my yeah. mom always tells me it's inappropriate to ask a woman no, her age. No, I'm 41. Okay. I, I just turned 41. Um, I started in 2010, uh, I came, uh, into U of T through the academic bridging program, which I actually highly recommend. So even if you're like a couple of years out of high school and you haven't decided what to do yet, it was a really excellent way to sort of determine whether or not this was even something I would be capable of doing. What, what is it? Because this is the first time I've ever heard about it. Okay, um, it's a program offered through Woodsworth uh, where you go to like one of four different classes that they offer, you choose one, um, it's part time, uh, so you go to it's evenings, so you go two evenings a week usually, um, and it is a full first year university course. Yeah. Uh, but basically, it's like try it out. If you fail, you fail. But if you get a grade higher than I think at the time it was seventy five percent, you were automatically admitted to full time studies. So you didn't have to apply the normal way because you would have this grade and that would get you into the program. So I did a history, like you know, Canadian history one hundred or whatever, yeah. um, and it was a really good experience. It was an excellent prof who, like, I still have contact with now. Um, and I did, uh, I did my first course that way. And you, yeah, you automatically gain admittance to, to school by just taking this one class. So you, you know, you spend 
a s smallish amount of money yeah. to take one class and there's not a lot of risk so i mean you put pressure on yourself to do really well if you if that's what you want yeah but mostly it's just to gain exposure like how much work is actually involved like how much homework am i going to be doing how much reading am i going to be doing and can i do this and also work and do the other things in my life that i need to do and i didn't have any kids when i started in 2010 um, and then i had four of them after that uh, and then I took a five-year break between 2011 and 2016 when I had two kids. Um, and then I came back in 2016 and I just, I take one or two classes at a time all throughout the year. And uh, it's a lot of work, but I think it'll be really rewarding when it's done. What's your secret formula to managing all of this stuff? Because there's a lot of people who, especially like even at my age, they say, oh, I'm so busy. I'm so stressed. I have all this stuff yeah. side by side with what you're doing. Eh. It might not compare. I feel like I you mean, got a lot. It, the secret is to just not really do anything well. <laughs> like to just do everything, but maybe not like A plus well, but just get everything done yeah. um, and just be happy with what you've done. Like I've gotten some grades where I'm like, oh, I could have probably done better than that. But I also did X, Y, Z in addition to this thing. So um, I just don't put a lot of emphasis on things that I think you have to when you're younger. Uh, like grades um, or you know I, like I just I just want to complete the degree and be happy with the work that I did mm -hmm. and take classes that I'm interested in yeah. and that's been the most fun part is like I don't need to do this to gain employment I have that and my job like the divorce rates anecdotally are going up yeah. <laughs> so I don't I don't need to do this to work um, and uh, but I just, I, I have a, I'm gonna do a minor in creative writing. That part is actually almost done. Um, and uh, it's, yeah, it's just let it be fun, take some of the pressure off. And I think that's been a huge blessing doing it this way. It's also like three times the cost though. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. So that part is bad. <laughs> yeah. Why'd you choose English now to study? Um, it started out as like a sociology degree and uh, as it turns out I really hated that yeah. as a subject. Um, I was, uh, yeah, uh, so I, I actually wrote a book uh, in 2022, it came out. That's awesome. Um, so What's I, it called? We'll plug yeah. it on the thing. <laughs> it's called Your Place or Mine. Um, it's a guide to developing successful co-parenting relationships, so yeah. for any kid that you know, it comes from a family with divorced parents or, um, you know, has friends that are from divorced families, they, you know, that it can be really challenging. And I, uh, my two, uh, my two boys, I share with their dad, we're divorced now and I'm repartnered, but, mm -hmm. uh, my two kids in the middle, we share be equally between our homes in a really, like we have a much better relationship now than we did when we were married. Yeah, yeah. Um, cause we have a common goal of just raising really great kids yeah. right so um yeah it's called your place or mine charlotte schwartz uh it's dunder and press in toronto um and uh, i think it can help a lot of people in a like very accessible way to just reframe the way that they think about separation and divorce and co-parenting yeah. and yeah it is becoming such a more widespread thing nowadays because i remember when my brother because my parents are also divorced my yeah. brother in like grade three yeah they were doing like cr christmas crafts so yeah. like you know you make ornaments in grade three for your parents and the teacher asked okay kids everyone raise your hand if you need to make two because your parents are separated it was like my brother and one other kid yeah like it wasn't it's but now it's like 50 percent of all marriages yeah. end in divorce yeah well and it's yeah it's about that in ontario it's just over 40 percent. okay but that's a lot yeah yeah and that actually that 40 percent actually only accounts for people who are legally married Right. But if you think about the number of families yep. where the parents never actually like went ahead and had a True. wedding, but they've been a family. Mm -hmm. There's lots of people like that, too, who end up splitting up and the impact is the same to the kids, like the piece of paper didn't yeah. matter to them. So there's a lot. It's probably over 50 percent if I had to guess. Do you think that that like number takes a bit of the pressure off of couples that are struggling like that because they know that they're not kind of in a fringe minority? It's just more of like a societal issue. 
Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people uh, feel more comfortable making that decision because like in the 80s when I was a kid, like nobody was divorced. And if Mm -hmm. if they were, it was like, oh, that like divorced lady down the street with the kids. Right. It was it was like a bit of a taboo thing. Um, But like it's a bit heteronormative to say, but if like women specifically have gained more power in the employment field and in, you know, earning their own money and stuff like that. And a lot of marriages just didn't end, even though they probably should have, because people are financially reliant on other people. But it's much, much more common now. And I think, um, it's much more culturally accepted now. Like we have, like the Kardashians have already been married like five times a piece (laughs) or something. Right. So it's, um, it's a and it's a good choice for a lot of people. It, I, my book just helps people to reframe looking at the end of rela- the relationship not as a failure, but as like what else did you do for like ten years mm-hmm. consistently? Probably not many other things, right? Yeah. And yeah, it's sometimes it's the best choice that people can make for themselves. I agree, and I think that it's like yeah, once you get to a point where. It's if you're gonna just stick it out, even though it's a toxic situation, then yeah. maybe that's not the best thing to do. Um, and it is a good point about how now that women are way more prevalent in the workforce, yeah. they're less reliant. I think that reliance was keeping marriages together. And like you said, that could be a bad thing in the sense that like people or women wives felt trapped yeah. and now they're stuck. But then do you also think that it could be like another reason for couples trying to stick it out where now it's kind of easy to give up? I mean, uh, it depends on the people and their like core values. Like a lot of people, there are people who think every problem can be fixed. I'm not one of those people. I think that relationships can evolve and become very different relationships. Like I never imagined not being married to my ex-husband, but here we are and we yeah, have yeah. a really excellent relationship now it's just really different like yeah. we're we're more like business partners now raising these kids yeah. so i think it really depends on the people and the personalities that are involved Got it. um and then some people are just really angry people mm-hmm. and they don't have an outlet for that that's true yeah that's a good point um it's tough because like i think it's a trend also just with how much disconnection there's been with not just couples but people in general yeah how everyone's kind of been trapped like this is now i'm not even talking about the pandemic but just overall society people are staying inside more staying in their houses you can uber eats food you can you know everything can be sent to you you don't need to go out anymore yeah so socializing social media video games you don't need to go out to that party the field party that all your friends were doing in high school right yeah so it's uh it's kind of sad yeah no it's it is and i didn't have like i barely had a phone when i was your age mm -hmm. to be honest i did but it didn't like you couldn't text or anything there were no videos to watch on it like it wasn't a little computer it was like a thing where you could dial numbers and make calls Absolutely. and run out of minutes. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever, have you heard about that? Well, no, I, that's what my phone plan is right now. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> so I do so run out of these minutes. These were all on like cards where Got like it. 45 minutes were up. Like you could be on the phone with like the police cause you have a <laughs> flat tire and it would yeah. like cut out if you were out of minutes. Yeah. And that's, that's the time in, in the world that I come from. <laughs> 100%. Yeah. Um, did because a lot of people in our generation i feel kind of romanticize your upbringing so like living as a kid in the 80s or the 70s and did you do that when you were a kid like because every i don't know maybe it's just a pessimistic kind of approach that people my age are taking but maybe it's actually the state of the world like it used to be much more simple Oh, I mean, it was more simple, like raising my own kids now, like I have a 10 year old who has a phone, right? Yeah. I, have a, I have a 14 year old, a 13 year old, a 10 year old and a five year old and the 14 year old and the 10 year old have phones. And like the, the, what is it? The FOMO, like they're uh, like mm-hmm. when my 10 year old gets home, the first thing that he does from school is like throws his backpack down and goes right up to the living room to turn on the PlayStation to play Fortnite because all his friends are on it and he has this headset and it's all like, bro, bro, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm working (laughs) because I work at home. I'm like, I'm working, I'm on the phone. Like, can you stop doing that? And they're intensely fearful of like what is going on and what they don't know is going on. And yeah, when I was 
10. I was born in 1982, so when I was 10, it was the early 90s, and like, literally, the most FOMO that I would have had was sitting by the radio, waiting for my favorite songs to come on so that <laughs> yeah. I could press play and record at the same time on the cassette yeah. thing to record the song so I could listen to them whenever I want to. Yeah. And, and if I missed it, by, like, because you have to get it right before the song starts, like you don't want to lose any of the sound, like you got to press those buttons and be like on it. And that was the scariest thing to me was like not you know, not being able to record like yeah. whatever Michael Jackson song was really popular <laughs> at the time. Like, so yeah, it's very scary. And then the, like the predatory things on the internet are terrifying. And like in the curriculum now in public school, they're teaching kids about safety on the internet. Mm. And like the internet wasn't a word when I was a kid. Right. Like it literally, we got the internet in my home when I was 15. Mm -hmm. And like we had one computer and that was for the whole family and you had to like make a schedule for when everyone could use it. And you also ran out of internet. <laughs> it was like the yeah, phone yeah. minutes, like you would run out of time and that would be it. Yeah. And I wasted all the internet downloading like torrents, like for illegal music. Right. <laughs> and everyone would be mad at me. Yeah. For, but yeah, it's terrifying what the, what kids have to do now just How as a function of society. Yeah. How do you like keep them safe as a mom without like necessarily being a helicopter parent, like always in their stuff? Because obviously you want them to be independent and grow up to kind of yeah. take care of things on their own. But uh, kids are kids at the end of the day. So right now, uh, because I feel like they're pretty young to like, did you have a phone when you were 14? 15. Okay. So I feel like they're pretty young to have phones right now, but also like they walk to school on their own and they like go to track and field on their own. Mm -hmm. And so like, I need a way to, I feel like I need a way to get in contact them, with them. Although my parents didn't have a way to get in touch with me. And all summer it was like, go ride your bike and we'll see you at dinner time. Yeah, like yeah. we just, they expected that I would be home when I said I would be home. Um, I think once a month I go through their phones what they don't necessarily know what I hope they don't see this when I'm doing it but I just I'm looking at texts and like you know the scam texts where someone will be like hi yeah and you're like who is this and they're like you don't remember me and then they send you like a photo of themselves yeah. and you're like no I have no idea who you are they get stuff like that only like they don't understand necessarily that it's a scam um, and just the things they're watching on YouTube like YouTube can so easily go from like those video game guys to like something really inappropriate very quickly just yeah. you know like the way that the way that the algorithms work and stuff so i go through their phones yeah. i'm not i pay for them so yeah. like literally i own They're the your phones, phones yeah. <laughs> uh, i have many phones yeah and i go through them and just make sure that they're safe and there have been a few occasions where i've had to talk to them about either the conversations that they're engaged in and i'm not trying to censor them but like they shouldn't be talking about certain things or saying certain things about other people or whatever. And you're yeah. trying to teach them like not to be mean people. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, I do that. Um, but mostly like you have to be observing all the time. Like it's not just about the phone, like who are their friends? Yeah. What are the activities? How are they doing well in school? Right. Cause it always a surefire sign that there's something amiss is if they're not doing great in school. Mm -hmm. And that's a metric that spans lots of things, not just about grades, but like, are they doing their homework? Do they have friends? Yeah. Is the teacher like, does the teacher like them yeah. and all that stuff. So we look at everything as sort of a package and that's sort of how we assess it really is like, how are you doing? Like generally, like mm -hmm. on the whole, are you good or are you not good? And then we tailor from there. How did having kids, you have four now yeah. after there was a time where you had none. Yes. How did that kind of, switch around your mindset because i'm someone who i can't wait to have kids oh, like really? okay. un until i'm until I, once i'm i guess financially capable yeah. of doing so i want to have kids right away yeah um which is kind of not the case for people my age i think people especially girls nowadays are really scared of the idea of having kids yeah. what do you think about that like how did it change you as a person um i became uh much more aware of like everything around me yeah. uh, cuz you just become like hyper vigilant about safety and you're not you, like I wasn't that person before and now I'm like 
you know, constantly yelling at them not to do yeah. this or that and look both ways when you're crossing the street and all the things like I'm all, and I'm like, I, I live on a quiet street, but it, it people go down the street really fast. It's Seems a, a lot louder street. when you have kids. And yeah. I'm like screaming in the street, <laughs> yeah. waving my arms, like, slow down, slow down. And I'm yeah. like, Oh my God, who am I? Like, <laughs> what has happened to me? So I do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but also it makes you more aware of like how not great the world is right now and how much you really want to do something to make that better. Mm -hmm. Because like that's the world that, I mean, you are inheriting, my kids are inheriting this world. And I'm not saying my generation did all the damage. I think a lot of it was done before that. But um, there are ways to, I mean, I feel like if you don't remain optimistic, there's no point, but yeah. there are ways to improve things and uh, the mobilization of people and those types of efforts are really important. Mm -hmm. And I do participate in a lot of social justice stuff and, um, and I take the kids with me to show that like, we're not just watching this happen. We're trying to, you know, add to the, I'm not saying we're doing something about it cause I don't believe we're really doing something yeah, yeah, yeah. by going to a protest or whatever, but I'm showing them one way to sort of lend your voice and your privilege to a cause. Um, and I've become much more aware of that. Like I didn't care about anything before I had kids yeah. at all. Like I, I cared about getting paid every two weeks. Yeah. I cared about what club we were going to on Thursday night, Friday night and Saturday night. Um, and that was it. Like yeah. I, I really didn't care about much yeah. and I care about a lot of things now. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. That's really good. So then where do you think you would be now without your kids? Oh, uh, I would have a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I would be really well rested. Got it. And I wouldn't have any um, of these lines on my forehead. Yeah. Um, no, and I would also, uh, I don't know. I always wanted kids. I'm from a really small family. I only have one sibling, and she's eight years younger than me. So I was kind of an only child, sort of. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I moved out when she was 13, yeah, yeah. right? Like it's such a weird, um, and I would be, I think really lonely and have like all this time and resource and nowhere for it to go. Mm -hmm. And thankfully my kids don't give me much choice where I spend my money. Like I just, I, I get it and then it's gone. Like it goes to something that they want to do or something that they want to buy. Yeah. So. Yeah, I don't even know that it's happening half the time. Yeah, that's yeah. fair. That's fair. For me, it was, there was like a Lego set I really wanted as a kid. Yeah. I was like, mom, I please need this Lego set. What was it? The rule was Star Wars. But like the Millennium Falcon? No, it wasn't that expensive. Okay. <laughs> I don't think, I think that one was like yeah. huge. My son wanted that one. It was a thousand dollars. He didn't get it. Yeah. Okay. But then he found it at a garage sale yeah. for $10. And he's very industrious. He came home with it and he was like, mom, look what I found. And it was already assembled. Yeah. And it was like a lot, like very intricate yeah, Lego. Yeah. And I was like, oh, what is that? And he, I don't know anything about Star Wars, even though I should, because I grew up like at its yeah, height, yeah. probably. I was like, oh, what is it? And he was like, it's the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars. And I was like, oh, and he's like, I only paid $10 for it. And I was like, okay, he's like, you want to know the coolest part? I can probably sell it on Facebook Marketplace for like 300. <laughs> and I was like... Oh, how old this is what he's 10, ten the 10 year old. Okay. Yeah. He's a really, really interesting child. And yeah. that's just one example, but yeah, it's Lego is a lot. Yeah. yeah. And what did like, what happened with it? Well, I was that obviously because my parents wouldn't just say like, yeah, we'll get it for you no matter what I had to score goals and hockey was the rule. Ooh. So you get three goals, you get a hat trick in this game. We'll okay. get you the set. So wow. Busted my ass out yeah. for a Lego set. Yeah. How many games did it take to actually make that happen? Oh, maybe like uh, 10. Okay. 10 so you really 15. wanted that yeah, Lego. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I wasn't that good. I wasn't that good. <laughs> I offered this particular kid $20 for every A on his report card. And he really showed me at hardcore last year, like 12 A's. And I was like, <laughs> and I'm not a math person. I was yeah. like, how much money is that? <laughs> it's yeah. a lot of money, but that's, yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Something with like these social issues I feel is happening with my generation. Like my generation is also very active in social justice, but there's another half of it that's like, what's going on here? What are we talking about? And I, I admit, I do have that sometimes where I'm like, this, is, this doesn't seem like an issue. Why are people so upset? And 
I think that the problem that I'm realizing is that people will propose an issue. So let's say like climate change. Yeah. People will say climate change is a problem. Here's all the evidence. It's a problem. This is our solution. Right. And when people don't like the solution, they'll just disregard the problem. Yeah. Which is something that, once again, I've fallen victim to that as well. So people yeah. will point out a problem. And because the solution to me makes no sense, I'll just say the problem doesn't exist. Yeah. Which is dumb. It makes no sense. I think that a, a approach that people in my position should start taking even if they don't like a particular solution, should maybe still acknowledge the problem. So yeah. whether it's climate change or any other social problem, I'm starting to realize that these issues like obviously are real, yeah. but let's find a different way to fix it. Not maybe I don't like the way that they're trying to do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like from your perspective, seeing what your kids are kind of living through, like, is there a lot of problem with schools? Cause we had a, protest like a few months ago about the sex education in schools here oh i know is yeah. that something that you kind of like are have dipped your toe into like do you know anything about it i do i mean all of my kids are in public school right now yeah. um so and that ranges from like senior kindergarten to grade nine um that's the, a big range also just to be doing these courses <laughs> yeah that's a lot yeah that's um, every single stage of yeah every breaking stage up of a kid. development yeah. um is like standing in front of me every morning <laughs> at like 7 a.m and i'm like oh great <laughs> um no it's the i mean the public school system is incredibly uh compromised it's underfunded we don't have enough teaching staff we don't have enough resources for supplies for kids um, and then uh, in particular, like I have one of my children is disabled and he's in a, a special program within the Toronto District School Board for kids with disabilities. And those programs have nothing. Mm -hmm. They have nothing because nobody really cares. So a big part of my advocacy work has been in the disability and education community. Um, just to bring attention to it, because that's one of the things where it's not in the news. Yeah. You don't really know until you need to know, but it still impacts thousands and thousands of people in Ontario. Like, yeah. I think one in 12 people in Ontario is living with some sort of disability. Um, and there are over like a million caregivers in Canada who are providing like one to one support to people with disabilities. So it's a lot. The school system is terrible, um, but also the only one that we have, mm -hmm. right? Um, we always should be advocating for more money and more resources for the school board. The sexual health curriculum was a, it was a great curriculum. It taught really simple things that I never learned mm -hmm. in school, like consent. Yeah, that seems like a really important thing for people to know. Yeah. Uh, it taught the sort of spectrum of, of identities, also really important. Uh, these people have always been here. Mm -hmm. We just didn't have words for it because they weren't teaching us anything, right? Mm -hmm. So automatically anything different was othered and not as, ex not as accepted or I'm not, I'm not finding the right word, but it wasn't, um, we're far more inclusive as a society now, but still not nearly as inclusive as we should be. Like my views on inclusivity is like, I just don't care what you do, <laughs> like mm -hmm. just be a good person, but I don't care how you identify. I like, I just don't care. I just want you to be a good person, be nice to other people. Yeah. And that's what I've told the kids all along. And we like out of four kids, we have two who are like presently not identifying as straight, but as other things. And I see parents struggling with that. And I'm like, what's your pro Like, what is the, why is that a problem? Like, are they a good kid? Mm -hmm. that's the part that's important. Like, are they hurting you by doing this? No. But there's a lot of, like, hard, you know, hard-learned rules that a lot of older people carry with them, and there's culturally and religiously, there's a lot of limitations on the way yeah. that people think. And, yeah. yeah, so I've, you know, like, we, we put a lot of effort into all of these things. But, yeah, sometimes it feels impossible. Like, there are so many things to care about. Which one do you put the emphasis on yeah. which one is the priority um, but I've been to a million you know when we elected Doug Ford it was like one of his campaign things was like you won't be standing at Queen's Park protesting anything because I'll be like the best premier you've ever had right yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been there like a million times <laughs> since the conservative government was elected in Ontario because there have been a lot of problems a lot of things slashed 
funding wise that were never supposed to be touched. Yeah. And, and it's scary because these are my kids in these schools that have no money. Right. Right. I hear you. Uh, the traditional, I guess, conflict between, if you want to call it parents versus professionals yeah. was when it came to like physical health, like doctors, yeah. where people would say the doctor knows better than the parent. No, the parent knows better than the doctor. And there was kind of that back and forth of who should really be looking out for their kid's health. Yeah. Is it the person who spent their life studying or is it the person who literally made the kid? Right. And now I think that's kind of moved. Obviously, there's still that problem, but there's now with teachers. It's like I am dedicating my entire life to raising this kid he yeah. for you it's one out of 40 students right you don't have the same amount of care for them as i do yeah so that's just kind of the side of like do you think that it should be parents responsibilities to teach their kids the things they want to learn instead of the school board i think that's a good question because you know a lot of people are electing to like withdraw their kids from certain parts of the curriculum mm -hmm. so they can take them home and t indoctrinate them the way that they want to. Um, no, I think all kids should be learning the same things because I think ultimately the, the curriculum that Ontario came up with is all facts. Like n none of that is interpretation, that's just facts. Here are the identities as we know them and what they mean and here are the body parts and their names as far as we know <laughs> like it's you know here don't touch someone without asking like those are all really simple things i think yeah. um and yeah i but i mean i i even know people in my circles who would be like oh, i don't agree with that i don't think the kids should be learning about that and like i i know people who are saying like 10 year olds shouldn't be learning about sex but then the kid goes home and plays the last of us on PS5. Not too sure what that is. Yeah, it's a video game that's like highly sexualized. It's a TV it. show now too that's very popular, Got but it. it's an end times thing and there's all kinds of stuff yeah. in it that like if your kids playing not they they don't already know. Yeah, yeah. Like they already know. They may not understand it, but they know. Interesting. Yeah. That's a good that's a good argument about how like it's kind of hypocritical as a parent if you're going to like push so hard for that and then not even see what's on the screen of your own kid. That yeah. makes sense. We'll take a quick break sure. for the cameras and yeah. then we'll get right back into it. Sure. Okay. So 1982. Yep. I was born in 2003. So okay. you are Gen X. Yes. That just barely. Just barely. I'm an elder millennial. That's the term. That's what they for call us. it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause a lot of people confuse, I think millennial, when, at least when people say millennial, it feels like they're talking about like my age. No, like is, people who came of age at the turn of the millennium, which, so I was 18 for like Y2K. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Which was actually really scary. I was going to say, like, <laughs> what was the world feeling during Y2K? Because everyone know. apparently, my mom tells me that everyone thought the world was going to end. They all the computers did. were going to blow up. Because you know what the problem with that was? It was a computer thing. Wasn't all it? the software was designed uh, for two digits instead of four. Mm. So it would have been like 97, 98, yeah, 99. Yeah, yeah. And then suddenly 2000, they're like, shit, we can't, we cannot handle yeah, that. Yeah. And it was a big uh, influx of jobs for a few years leading up to 2000 because they had to hire all these programmers just to fix the code. That's crazy. At all, mostly at the banks and like things where they were really concerned about like everything just falling offline basically. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was scary and they were like, and the, it, you know, the hydro grid is going to go out and there's going to be no power and then you won't have any food cause it's all going to rot <laughs> yeah, and yeah. the sun will stop burning and yeah. like, it was really scary. Um, but I was at a house party cause I was 18 I was like, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, and at the house party that I was at. Um, the girl's parents shut the lights off at midnight. We were all like doing the countdown and then all the lights went off and we were like, Oh, <laughs> oh my God. And I, but I was, we were in her basement and I looked through the little basement window and all the lights were on across the street. And I was like, Oh, it's a joke. Good joke. Yeah. But it was, it was a scary time, but the, the few years after 2000 were scary. It was a scary time to be a young person. Yeah. Like, yeah. How were you as a high school student in general? Um, 
like I'm sure the study habits and just the lifestyle is not the same as the student you are now. No, like we didn't have computers. Let's start with that. Right. Like we did, but you had to like fight for them in the library. You didn't have your own computer yeah, that you yeah. took to school. Like, yeah. Um, That's another thing. Libraries now, people just see libraries as like a space yeah. to type and study. Yeah. And before it was like that was where all the books were. Yep. You had to go find what you had to learn. Yep. There yeah. were, and like uh, the digital textbook thing to me is so weird. Like I, yeah. when my courses have a real like physical book, I still get that because yeah. I actually, I'm, I'm finding I'm not learning as much from the digital version of textbooks. Yeah. There's some added layer of retention when you're like reading it on paper, which I think is actually a proven I believe it. thing, but um, yeah, there were no, I mean, I was a good student, like, but I went to a regional arts high school, so I did a, a drama program, so I had to take an arts credit every semester, so whereas you only needed one to graduate, I ended up with, like, ten of them, mm -hmm. um, which meant less electives, because they were all eaten up by that, yeah, yeah. Um, but I was a good, I wasn't, I'm not a great math or science person, and I always put a lot of pressure on myself to to get good grades in those things, but I never did. Mm -hmm. So it just felt like this constant failure until I just accepted like, look, some people are good at some things and you are not good at these particular things. Um, but I, high school was fun for me. Mm -hmm. Arts high schools are great places for kids who like don't necessarily fit into a specific box because um, everybody is there, like everyone is represented in an arts high school. You've got people from all over the place identifying all kinds of ways. And it's a very early and organic way to be an adult who comes into the world, like not being confused by like someone being gay or like, right. you know what I mean? Because you've already been around all of it. Yeah. And they've, those people have been your friends and that's been a big part of your sort of coming of age. So... I was a good student, but I really just wanted to have fun yeah. in high school. Like I also, cause the year 2000 was like looming. I was like, well, the world's going to end anyway. So <laughs> yeah. like, yeah. why bother? I hear you. And then it didn't. And then I had to get a job. <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious for me. It was cause my high school, Orangeville in general, yeah. very white town. Yes. When I was growing up, at least it's still pretty white. It's pretty white. Yeah. So. Um, but I went to high school in Brampton which is not very not white, as white yeah. right and my mom had the same kind of idea like for you it was you're around like gay people or whatever yeah. these different people in the arts program but for me it was like if i don't know my mom had this worry i didn't I'm, like i don't think it was really based in anything but she was worried that like if i stayed in orangeville my entire childhood then i would not be able to cooperate as well with like immigrants that might be coming into the workforce. Because you just wouldn't be exposed to them. Exactly, because yeah. you didn't have that experience, right? Yeah. Um, but so, so once again, I don't know if that would be true or not, but either way, I went to Brampton, was yeah. the minority of the school. Like right? there was not a yeah. lot of white people. It was yeah. African and Indian and yeah. that's just how it was. But yeah. no, it's like some of my best friends because at the end of the day, like I think that a lot of these like racial stereotypes don't necessarily aren't based in the color of someone's skin but maybe just more the culture they're from yeah so like a brown guy who was born and raised in canada is yeah. is no different than the white guy who's born and raised in canada i think the difference comes from the it's a brown guy who was born and raised in like the middle east who right. lives a completely different culture different life yeah, yeah totally and different even if it's life. a white guy born in the middle east yeah. i'm gonna relate more obviously to the brown guy who's canadian than yeah. the white guy who's middle eastern yeah you know what i mean yeah so that's just something that i feel like is a bit of a misconception yeah for sure when it comes to you exposing your kids to like a lot of different groups like how do you balance the line between like, you know, mingle with everybody, you know, be accepting of differences because that's kind of what you want your kids yeah. to be. Um, but then also like choose your friends wisely. Like if you have friends that are getting into bad stuff. Yeah. My mom always told me you're the five people, you're the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. So yeah. choose wisely. Yeah. I mean, so far we haven't had any problems. Well, I mean, we have, we've had a couple of problems. Um, the, but mostly it's been okay. It's uh, the kids know like my 
primary objective in in their relationships and their friendships in their you know life at school is just to be around good people so however they interpret the term good people that's what i'm asking them to do right and so yeah we've had some experiences where but you know usually like the world has changed a lot since i even i was a young adult like we've culturally we've shifted a lot from the what's wrong with you to what happened to you mm. right like what happened to you to make you behave this way okay. or like what is happening at home to make you treat my kid this way and like i find that that adds a lot of gentleness to every interaction mm. because when you're looking at like a t often a 10 year old has not done anything wrong right Right, like a little, uh, kids are not really capable of causing that much harm intentionally. Intentionally, But right. they've seen it, they've witnessed it. Things are not good at home. If you consider like the high volume of separated and divorced parents and yeah. single parents and all, the, and all the economic disadvantages that have come out of the pandemic plus the ones that existed before that. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of things and you, you, it's really helpful and really brings you down a notch if you look at the kid. Like I had a kid throw an entire light bright in my house down two flights of stairs at a birthday party. And I was like, and I was like, what is wrong with that? And I was like, wait a minute, there's something going on yeah. here. And we're just, I'm gonna ask him to clean up the light bright. But light like, brights were awesome, my, I forgot they, about they, those. They've made a, they've, they're, they're making a comeback. That's so good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, like I just dealt with it the way that there are a lot of things like my parents are all, like my parents are also divorced but i was 21 when they split up but my sister was a kid yeah. my sister was 14. and the impact to both of us is very different because i was already out of the house but yeah. probably from like five i was wondering when my parents were getting divorced mm. Right. So like they did not have a good relationship or a good dynamic. And yeah. we were witnessing that all the time. Yeah. And it's definitely for better or worse informed like who I am today and how I parent today. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, you're, the kids are always watching and it's really important to show them that instead of being like, what the hell is wrong with that kid? You, there's another way to look at it, which is like, how can we help them? not do this or not feel that way mm -hmm. is there ever a misalignment between like what your kid sees as a good person versus what you do for sure yeah yeah how do you how do you like handle that how do you deal with that if I it's mean, someone that you don't want him spending time with but he's like no this guy, he's a nice person so i think organically most of those things will sort themselves out you know like the kid will end up being a jerk to my kid and my kid will be like oh whatever i don't want to be friends with him anymore right. um and then, yeah, and then sometimes things, uh, kids, I believe that a lot of people have to learn things the hard way. I don't, I don't think you can save everyone and especially not your kids when they become teenagers and stuff from hard learned yeah. truths, right? Like my oldest uh, was in a relationship with like a first relationship, right? Like, cause they're 14 now. Yeah. Um, with this person who was like highly manipulative and would send like 4,000 text messages a day being like, where are you? Why aren't yeah. you responding to me? And I was like, whoa, this is the kind of stuff that I saw in my early twenties. Yeah. Like, and you guys are like kids, this is silly. Yeah. And like this kid needs to do some homework or something right. and stop doing this. Yeah. And, uh, I did say like, hey, I'm concerned about this. I don't like this dynamic. I don't like the way this person makes you feel. But I think you're going to figure that out on your own. Like if I tell you to stop talking to this person, I know from having been a kid myself, you're not just going to stop talking to them. And she did learn the hard way and it was really hard for her. Mm -hmm. Her feelings were really hurt. She was very upset. But like that person is a distant memory now. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes you just... I, sometimes you have to learn the lesson that way. Like I can't protect my kids from every terrible thing that's going to happen to them. I, I wish I could, but then they wouldn't learn anything either. Right. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Sometimes. Yeah. Like, you know, even if something bad's coming, it's like, this is going to help them in the long run. Yeah. If you shield them from everything, then they just become a shell of a person. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, so you said your parents were also divorced. Yeah. I sometimes like, 
not to make this sound really weird, but I sometimes try to like reverse engineer kind of my parents' relationship to see how do I in future have a successful marriage because that's everyone's goal. And as like my mom says all the time, if I thought I was going to get divorced, I wouldn't have gotten married. Right. Like no one goes in with that intention. No, it's just ridiculous. Never. Um, but like from what you saw with your parents, how did you learn like what relationship, I guess, knowledge or techniques or advice like did you gain from that? I mean, one of them for sure was to not um, sort of sink into this situation where you become financially dependent on another person, like have your own stuff, have your own bank account and also just be aware. Like I, my mom had like stacks of bills that she didn't know like where to get money to pay and like financial stuff was always a big thing with my parents. That scared me a lot and I've always tried to not fight about money and not you know but it's a thing like everybody money is a is a problem Mm -hmm. (laughs) like it becomes a problem um and so i try to not sort of focus on that too much like i know that we as a family spend too much money and hope that one day we will spend less money Mm -hmm. but kids are expensive and life is really expensive right now like you know, housing and food and all, it's just, everything seems totally inaccessible right now. And I hope that sorts itself out, but yeah, I mean, have your own stuff, be your own person. Mm -hmm. Like the, these people who are married and like spend all their time with each other or just like live in tandem and don't have other relationships outside, like don't have friends and don't, you know, play a sport or go to the gym or like have a situation where there's other people around is really unusual. Uh, and it's really suffocating to to be in this situation where like, it's just the two of you or, you know, the two of you and your kids or whatever, and you just don't have anything happening outside of those walls. Don't do that. It's a trap. Mm -hmm. Um, now this has become my advice to you. (laughs) Don't do it. It's a trap. Um, having kids is really great. Uh, and very rewarding and also a ton of work. Yeah. So like, don't expect every day to look like Instagram or what, like it, cause it doesn't yeah. like it, life isn't like that. And like, like I said, I have one kid who's disabled and like, we didn't know, not that it would have changed anything. But we didn't know that was going to be the case. Yeah. It was something that sort of, um, evolved over time after he was born. Uh, and that's not anywhere close to what I thought life would be like taking care of a kid, but it's still like beautiful and rewarding. Mm -hmm. It's just different. Mm -hmm. Um, and so uh, having fewer expectations about what things are going to look like is also really important because you just stress yourself out the moment that things are left of the way that you sort of thought they were going to be Mm -hmm. becomes very stressful. And if you can just sort of go in with an open mind and think like this is going to go a number of different ways and also will change many times over the years, it's an easier way to live. Yeah. Yeah. My cousin goes to college in the U.S. Okay. Liberty University in Virginia. Yeah. It's like a heavily Christian university. Yeah. College. And something she tells me a lot is that there are a lot of disabled students in the school. Okay. And I'm like, why is why is that? Yeah. And she says, like Christians say, it's their kind of responsibility or their job to take after, take yeah. care of these people. Yeah. And they see them as like whatever. We're all made in the image of God, and they're no less than we are, even though they struggle with something that we might not struggle with. Right. What like does do you have any sort of connection to? like a spirituality or I just wonder like because there's a lot of talk even now with when we talk about disabled rights and stuff Mm -hmm. like uh, this is a very touchy subject I'm not trying to like yeah that's okay get too dark or anything but the debate around things like abortion and stuff and if you see that you know your kid's gonna have a hard life in the future does that justify taking certain actions like right what do you think about that whole side of things I mean, um, it's, I, I mean, personally, I, 
my my personal belief is that you should do what's right for you Mm -hmm. uh whether there's going to be anything wrong with your baby or not or you're it's not even a baby that early but you know like if you're pregnant and you don't want to be that should be your choice one there's that a lot of people don't agree with that but that happens to be my belief um i don't think that either side i think that the problem is that the main core issue of that yeah. whole argument is that one side believes it's a human baby a human like a life and the right. other side doesn't which like scientifically we know that it's not okay right well i mean yeah, yeah. like that's the thing is that science that some one side uses yeah. science the other side uses what i said about faith right about this is still right. god's child but like literally a baby isn't even a baby until it is like outside of your body so even though like i have been more than nine months pregnant a couple of times mm-hmm. like literally two of my kids were born two weeks after their due date which is 42 weeks of being like this giant thing like walking around and you can't breathe because your lungs are like right here yeah. and they're like fully moving around and you can like see where their elbows are and yeah. stuff and you're like there's a whole person in there and yeah. they're still not a baby it. until they are born it. right it's a really interesting like the way that that shifts but um yeah, I mean, there's lots of, because my son is disabled. He has a rare disease. So genet- from a genetics perspective, he carries two copies of a rare disease, one from me, one from his dad. Okay. And that is how he developed the rare disease. We had never heard of it before he was born. We didn't know we were carriers of it. It's a one in 60,000 people are born with it. It's called classic galactosemia. Mm-hmm. We had no idea even what it was until he was diagnosed with it. It's something with like lactose, like yeah. kind of digesting yeah, in the wrong he doesn't, way. Yeah, he doesn't convert lactose to glucose. Got it. So on the face of it, you're like, okay, so just don't have milk and you'll right, be right, fine. Right. But it's, it's, the damage occurs at a cellular level. So in his case, like, or in, well, any baby, whether you're, you're feeding them like breast milk or formula, they're both milk. They both yeah, yeah. have lactose in them. Yeah. Um, so he was getting milk for 10 days of his life, the first 10 days. And the, the sugars, because they're not converting, store in the brain, the ocular cavity, and the liver. Yeah. So by the time he was 10 days old, he was really, really, really sick. Uh, his liver was failing, and the storage of the milk sugars in the brain caused basically brain damage, like an mm-hmm. unquantifiable amount of brain damage. So he's now what you would call intellectually disabled uh, because of that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there would be no way of knowing that. So, But then we went ahead and had another kid because you never, there's no way to know if yeah, the yeah. next child is going to have it. And people would say things like, oh, you're so brave to have another kid like what if he has the same thing as Isaiah his name is Isaiah as Isaiah and I was like well then I guess we'll just love him the same, take right? care of him too yeah. like yeah. like another and you know and he Rivers is the other one he doesn't happen to have it but he could have one in four chance that he because that's the way the genetics work it's like one in four they'll have it one in four they'll be totally unaffected two in four they'll be a carrier got it I don't know how that actually works because I'm not a doctor and I, I don't, see. I have never been to medical school. <laughs> I can see how that makes sense. Yeah. But yeah, but I mean, you got to do what's right for you for what's right for a lot of people is not having any children. What uh, is right for me sort of is having four of them. It really depends on the person. Yeah. Um, but from a religious perspective, I just don't happen to be, I wasn't raised with any sort of religious involvement. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's just never been a thing. Like I think things happen whether you prey on them or not. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm a big believer in actual action. Yeah. So not you know not like wishing and hoping that things will be better, but actually doing something about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. And a lot of the times that I ask people, because I, I, people, I have people from all different kind of schools of thought come and sit here, which is yeah. the best thing about this is that yeah. I hear different perspectives. And something I do hear a lot of is like what works for you, yeah. which is what you're saying right now. It's like, if for me, this is what I do, but yeah. you don't, you're not trying to pass judgment. Like if you, like if prayer works for you, pray. Yeah. If it doesn't, then you don't need yeah. to. If kids, yeah. if you want to have kids, have them. If you don't, if you, then don't. Yeah. Which is, um, which is cool. Like be who you are. Be who you are. Yeah. Basically. That seems really oversimplified, but be who you are. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, that's, it's true. I, I'm a huge, 
I, there's n- almost nothing in the world I love more than freedom, the idea of freedom, right, right. which is just like, this is why I think that especially now, like kids, kids, I say kids, 20 year olds, yeah. university students are becoming so like kind of ingrained with politics and stuff is because it, I think it connects to the core idea of like yeah. freedom, yeah. Um, which is, which is a thing. It's but, good though. Like, do you vote? I vote. Yeah. Okay, good. Cause yeah. a lot of people didn't when I was your age. No. They were, Cause they, again, because they were kind of like. There's a lot of complacency in young people, I find, because you're kind of like, well, what's what difference will it make? Mm-hmm. And the the reality is, it actually does make a difference. It may not feel like it, but yeah, what, like explain that that kind of misconception. Is it even a misconception? Because I I've had this conversation before. It's like if I go to the voting poll or not, yeah. unless the vote is one like is one vote apart from this party versus that party, yeah. I won't have an effect. But if everyone thinks that way, there will be an effect. Yes. So so how do you like, how do you switch someone over from that like kind of thought process? I mean, I, uh, I've had this discussion with so many people and I, like I said, I have a younger sister and then like just friends and a big part of it is like uh, voting feels like a, total just you know when the party that you were putting all your effort behind doesn't win you're like oh what was the point right but the point is one like a hundred years ago i couldn't do that at all so i kind of owe it to all of the people involved in that mobilization of efforts to even win the right for women to vote and to there are so many places in the world still where a woman can't just go and cast a ballot in an election and there are countries that don't have a democracy yeah which is wild right but Mm -hmm. that's a reality for a lot of people there are students that go to this university who come from countries where they can't vote um or even make you know certain decisions about their own life so we, I think we owe that, right? Like just, I just happened to win the lottery by being born in, I was born down the street from here, yeah. right? Like I, that's just winning a lottery of sorts. I agree. Being born here and being able to have all the privileges that come with being born here. Mm-hmm. Um, but neither of my parents were born here. So, you know, like they had very different lives because they weren't born here. Um, and I get to see the difference in like my life and theirs as a result of that yeah. and they definitely struggled a lot more than i have or that i will yeah just because they were born in a different like on a different continent yeah. <laughs> right yeah. um but yeah we we owe it to a lot of people who did all these great things before us to just use that privilege that they won for yeah. us um, and also it makes a difference like it, it does matter who wins the election to a degree, but like I take my kids to vote with me. And so I'm showing, you know, like this is, I'm voting, like I'm taking the time out of my day to go stand in line because I believe that better is possible. Yeah. And here's my version of, of how we're going to work toward that. Yeah. So it's important. Like the optics are important. Mm-hmm. Exercising the right to do those things is important. Yes, I agree. And the further and further I think that humans kind of progress and build and develop a culture or society or country even, like when you look around Toronto, these huge, huge buildings that have been here longer than we have, right? Um, It can kind of feel scary for some people, especially young people growing up and thinking like, how am I even supposed to have an effect on the world? Like, are you like, it can feel like that. But I was listening to Steve Jobs say that one of like the biggest kind of mental shifts that people can take is once they realize that everything around them was built by people that were no smarter than them. Yeah. Right. Like, I I don't know. I just think of Bill Gates or Elon Musk or whoever these people, like I like to think of these people as they used to be babies. Right. Like me. Literally. And like, yeah, they change the world. Everyone kind of starts sort of in the same place. Yeah. Yeah. Give or take. Yeah. Yeah. Um, give or take but no that's that's cool yeah how do you keep in touch with the younger generation do you even try because i know a lot of parents there's there's two kind of classes there's the old traditional oh these kids are are ridiculous they're nothing like us and then there's the ones that try to you know stay in with no i um uh, because i'm in my third year now i have a lot of classes that are really small like in the creative writing field right like a lot of the classes are 20 people um 
and it's you know, part of the reason that I am so optimistic is because I have the privilege of spending a few hours a week with a room full of people who are half my age. Yeah. And you're all so, I mean, for the most part, not all, not all of you, but most of you are so, you're there, you're working hard, you also have a job on the side or like all these interests and you're like who you are unapologetically. Like that wasn't a thing when I was, everyone was the same when I was 20. Got it. And we were all hiding who we were because we were so worried about what other people or our parents or whoever would think. Kids are very different now. And mm -hmm. I think that's a testament to some improvement in the world. Um, or maybe it's just here and maybe the rest of the world still sucks. I'm not sure. But it's tr here is great. Um, and they're so smart and capable and passionate about what they're doing. And I think that's such a nice thing to see, like that not everyone has, you know, like, yeah, the world is terrible, but you can make it better. Mm -hmm. And it's so nice to see that like people are still making that effort and showing up every day to, to do those things and that they have like dreams and ambitions. And, you know, one day they want to write like the best book, the best selling book that there will ever be yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Like, it's so nice to see that and it gives me hope because like i come from a generation of people who like largely a lot of them gave up very early very early on mm -hmm. you know like a lot of people gave up in high school so yep. it's nice to see people are not giving up in you know in spite of everything that looks like it's falling down around them yeah yeah well, this has been a very good conversation. <laughs> Do you have any final thoughts that you want to share with the people on the podcast before we wrap up? Um, yeah, just, I mean, it seems so simple, but um, I'm doing a million different things at once, so anything is possible. And just don't be who you are and don't don't give up. Like, there's always, there is something better and brighter ahead always. It just is really hard to see sometimes, but it, it is there. It's awesome. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching. That is Charlotte Schwartz, episode 41. And we will see you next Sunday. Like the interview, follow on Instagram at Voices of Vic. Thank you for doing this once again. Thank you. Peace out, everybody.